Hello, welcome to the webinar, Architectures for Digital Transformation and Next Generation Systems of Engagement, presented by Aerospike with guest speaker Noel Yuhana. I'm Brian Bulkowski, and I'll be your moderator for today. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in on the right-hand side of your screen in the Q&A box, and the panelists will get to them at the end of the session. Right now, please take it away. Noel. Thanks, um, thanks Brian. Um, this is Noel Johanna, analyst at, with Forrester Research, and uh, today I'm going to talk about the whole um, area of digital transformation and systems of engagement. Um, this is actually a very interesting topic. Um, as a Forrester analyst, we get a lot of inquiries, and one of the bigger chunk of inquiries we get is around the digital transformation and also the systems of engagement. Um, this is an area which has been growing uh, a lot in terms of its uh, uh, adoption. Uh, people are really building platforms for the digital transformation. Uh, we are trying to digitize everything. It becomes a, a bigger challenge as to how you build a platform uh, that is scalable uh, that is available, um, that is integrated as well. So that actually is, is, is a big challenge. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the trends, what we see uh, around this. Um, if you look at it in terms of the digital business, uh, um, it's all about the data, right? I mean, it's the, the data is a new currency, <laughs> it's a new oil, right? It's an asset. I mean, if you look at it, Today, more than 8% of enterprises are making money out of data, 8%. And that's going to triple, triple in the next three years. Um, data has become very, very important today. In fact, it's an asset, actually. You can make money, as I mentioned, right? So, so this is definitely important. You have to have a very strong um, business, uh, digital transformation business strategy to evolve in your organization as to how are you going to use that data for the benefit of your business users, for your employees, for your customers, for your partners, and, and that's critical, right? I mean, you want to actually be able to have a strategy in place. And, and I think this is what we're seeing today is a lot of people have kept data in silos for decades. Right, we have built applications in, in silos, and that data wasn't shareable. Right, but today the data needs to be available to everyone within the enterprise. Right, um, that becomes very, very challenging. Right, I mean, how do you build an architecture platform which transforms your your whole business? So, if you look at it in terms of the data explosion, actually. <laughs> Uh, it's it's about 3.5 zettabyte of data today in public net. Um, it's, it's, it's many 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 zeros actually, <laughs> and and you know this data actually is just growing in fact very very rapidly. In fact, over the last I think just a few years we doubled the data actually, <laughs> last I think three to four years. Uh, that's the significance of data here, right? I mean the data is not only coming in from our traditional data sources like the databases which we had in traditional senses. But also we got these new data sets coming in from the sensors, the IoT, the cloud, the mobile platforms, the social media platforms, right? And, and this actually creates a bigger challenge. Uh, your older architectures don't really, you know, are, are not really driven to support these new types of data sources coming in. Uh, and, and the volume, the, the variety of data really impacts uh, your business, I guess, you know. So, so what's driving this need for digital transformation, right? If you look at it, obviously mobile devices, right? I mean, everyone has got a, a phone today, right? In fact, there are more than seven, eight billion whatever phones out there. People are carrying more than one phone actually today. Um, and, and, and we need data now, right? I mean, it's not that we want data like you know, tomorrow. <laughs> or, or imagine your emails came in an hour later, right? It's not acceptable. Right. We need data now. Enterprise data is not there. Right? I mean, emails are fast, SMSs are fast. What about your enterprise data? Right? It goes through a transformation kind of a category where it moves from a, 
um, kind of a transactional systems to operational systems to analytical systems. By the time the data gets to the business user, it's 24 hours later the BI user looks at the data. That's not acceptable anymore, right? Uh, because these mobile devices actually are changing some of these way we are building these uh, systems. But also, uh, <clears throat> sensor data that tracks everything in real time is changing uh, the business's competitive pressure. I think every company today in the healthcare, retail, oil and gas, uh, you know, financial services, these companies are definitely putting a lot of strategies around you know, data um, in terms of making data more available to different line of businesses in, in a more self-service automated manner as quickly as possible so that they can make better decisions out of that. And, and this obviously puts a lot of competitive pressure, right, because there are other companies doing this. Uh, if you're not going to do, if you're not going to modernize your data platform today, you probably are going to be left behind, and that will be visible through revenue impacts as well, right? Uh, the push from businesses to support real-time data access has become very, very important. Business users are demanding new insights. I guess you guys hear that all the time, right? I mean, business users are coming, thing. I don't want old data anymore. I don't want stale reports. I want different types of reports. I want to be able to create my own reports, right? from all the data that, that's available. Things have changed a lot. Now, it's a, it's a, if you look at this chart, which is a very interesting chart, talks about the, the big disruption, the mega trends, as we call it. Right? There's the age of the, the manufacturing back in the 1900s with Ford and Boeing and GE and, and others. And, and we got distribution, the age of the distribution, which is the, in the 60s with Walmart, Toyotas and others. And, and then you got age of information, with Amazons and Googles of the world. And then now, we are in the age of the customer. It's empowering the business um, and, and, and empowering the business user and, and the users and consumers as well, right? Uh, there's, there's this customer obsession trend we've seen where you have to cater for not customers in, in a category, right? But customers uh, in, in, in a more personalized manner, right? Like, like if, 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 if I get a, uh, an email just specifically to me saying that, hey, by the way, Noel, we'll give you a 50% discount on a pair of jeans that you're looking for, that is individualized, personalized experience. Not to everyone say, hey, by the way, we'll give you 50% <laughs> discount for everyone, right? But that personalization level is very important. Uh, and I think that's changing the way uh, how businesses operate today. Think about it, well, if you have a million customers, how can you individualize personalize that experience for those individual customers, those millions of customers out there. It's a challenge. You need a different data platform, actually, altogether. <laughs> think about it. Well, how do you prevent churn, right? This is a big topic of discussion today. I think every organization, every company today is dealing with churn. Uh, today, you know, you're a customer, that, you know, this customer can, can change to uh, being uh, another vendor customer. <laughs> another product customer, another brand customer, right, very, very quickly. You can go to the internet and see the Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn and all those things and, and get information. By the way, this product is better than the other product. What are you going to do, right? So, so I think the churn is, is a big trend, and I think you got to start to look at what are the things you can do in your organization to help your businesses grow faster and, and, and deliver better value <coughs> to your customers as well. <coughs> Netflix, right? I mean, I think most people use Netflix. And, and it's all about individualized recommendation, what Netflix gives today, right? It's not that, hey, by the way, you would like the, the Die Hard movie. It, it's based on your, your sequence of things you have done in terms of <clears throat> what movies you have watched, what other people have watched, and then trying to associate that, right? I mean, this is how do you give a pre perfect recommendation, right? Which I think is very, very important. And, and this actually does, this requires a bit of more <laughs> computing and, and knowledge and, and, and data as well, right? So enterprise want to integrate data across many touch points and channels, if you look at it, right? You got call center data, you got branch data, you got TV, you got emails. And so, you know, traditionally, we have not done that. We have not done that integration of data across these touch points. We were only concerned about CRM data. That was it. And call center data. And that was it. What about social data? Right? Can we integrate with those, so, 
uh, social data as well, like Twitter and Facebook. What about my mobile data, knowing my geolocation? If I'm in the mall, I can get an alert, right, from, from this company and, and offer some additional discounts. That that will be great, and that will be great for, for this company, right? So uh, I think there's a lot of these things that are different today than what, what is there. Now, you can program this if you wanted to do the touch, touch points <laughs> uh, through writing some scripts and programs to do it, right? Uh, it becomes very, very complex to do it, right? But you actually really need like a database, actually, which is more intelligent, it's more scalable, which is more integrated. It, just, it can also be available uh, to all the time. So I, th I think we're going to talk a bit more about that database platform as to what's required. But there's also this IoT as well, right? I mean, if you look at IoT, um, this is huge. In fact, Cisco predicts 50 billion devices to be connected by 2020. In fact, Forrester estimates 30% usage of industrial IoT in manufacturing and will double by 2019. Huge growth around this. And I think we're just scratching the surface when it comes to IoT from engines and machines and factories. Uh, we got consumer IoT, we got, we got industrial IoT going on there. Uh, there's lots, lots of data coming in. And this obviously requires, again, a platform uh, which is more, more integrated as well. So if you look at it, you know, we talk about, in traditional sense, system of record, right? Then you got system of operations, and this new category called system of engagement, right? So this is the, how the correlation works, right? I mean, system of record has been our traditional legacy platforms where the CRM and mainframe and databases, um, legacy databases have, have existed, right? This, this holds our legacy data, and that, they're not gonna go away anytime soon, right? I mean, those are still needed, right? Uh, but there's this new types of, scenarios we have seen like system of operations, right, where you have to be able to um, provide data <clears throat> for different types of variables and, and carriers, and industrial equipment. Uh, it's more about awareness and actions, right? I, I think that's an important area where we see it. It's operations, right? Whatever operations you do for your business, that's part of the system of operations. Whenever somebody's calling the call center, that's the operations as well, right? But then this new category is more about the customer system of engagement, right? How do you interact with this customer through mobile devices, mobile phones, tablets, browsers, right? Wearables. I mean, and this is the category which I think is more exciting because you really bring your products, your business closer to the customer, which we have never done before, right? And this is a system of engagement. This requires a bit of rethinking your architectures about how you're gonna blend all of these things together. You can't really operate one or the other. You really have to have a combination of these things, three, three, three bubbles um, to deliver in, in most of these applications. Some of these applications could be siloed, but yet you want a combination of things because you want to be able to provide data not only from your legacy platform. I want to be able to know your customer address and telephone numbers, but yet I want to know what they're doing over the last few hours. That's not in a system of record, by the way, right? So. So this new business applications and insights are demanding modern and optimized databases, right? I mean, if you look at it, the whole list, we just talked about, about a few use cases like the age of the customer, which is about personalization, IoT, which is machinery and, uh, analysis uh, and maintenance, and then real-time analytics, 360-degree view of the business, global transactions, gaming, fraud detection, mobile. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on, right? From a digital transformation and digital business, you really have to automate all of these things, right? And, and, and you really have to have, either you can program this, as I mentioned, through many, many hundreds of developers writing code, or you actually have a more optimized, more scalable, more integrated databases, actually, which can handle a lot of these things uh, your, no, by, by the platform itself, right? So, so what is the, the businesses want today and, and what does IT wants, right? So if you look at older uh, database architectures are failing to meet the new business requirements. So, so the business users want access to real-time data. They don't get it, right? I mean, in other words, they only get part of the data actually <laughs> or some data sets is available to the business user, not everything, right? And this is where we are moving towards. If you're not doing it today, five years from now, you'll be doing that. Maybe two years from now, you'll be doing that, right? So we are, we are on this journey to be, be able to make data available to every business user uh, 
in real time, right? Uh, and obviously, your your platform has to change, right? Uh, data has to help with accurate decisions as well, right? The data has to be more accurate as well, because there's a lot of duplication goes on in in uh, in organization. Redundancy goes on. Uh, which one is a single version of the truth and which is not? It, it becomes a bigger challenge, right? Uh, collaboration becomes uh, important as well amongst the line of businesses and, and, and I think this is another area we start to see more people are putting uh, uh, more effort. In fact, the line of businesses from marketing and sales and finance groups are, are, are starting to becoming more uh, relevant from the technology perspective, right? In, in other words, they are looking for data platforms or, or systems that can actually deliver more value to them in, in, in a more automated manner, right? As opposed to actually having them um, using older systems and, and older techniques of doing it, right? Um, data can tell more about the customer. I, I think this is important. The data that can tell more about the customer, I think this is where you're seeing lots and lots of companies spending lots and lots of millions of dollars on there. Uh, because obviously customer is important. I think every every company has a customer. This is where you make money, right? Whether it's a business customer, or whether it's a consumer customer, right? And I, I think I think uh, this is an area which I think needs more attention, especially uh, for your database architectures you have built over time. Uh, that needs to be modernized. That need to be re-architected as well. Now, what does IT want, right? The IT organizations struggle, I guess, with with the volume, right? I think everyone is talking about terabytes all of a sudden. Right? What about terabytes, right? So uh, uh, even terabytes, I think, is is a challenge, right? I was hearing a customer telling me about that we have 10 terabyte database, uh, traditional database, and, and 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 still struggling with that 10 terabyte databases, right? Some people are talking about terabytes. We are still struggling with 10 terabytes of data. So, so if you think about it, you really have to look at new architectures of how the 10 terabyte database could actually be upgraded, migrated to this another platform that can help you there, right? Uh, ensuring global availability is a very important thing, right? I think every business today is talking about global availability um, because you're doing global business operations, right? I mean, everyone has got in every region today, <laughs> some activity going on, right? Um, That's why you have to have 24 by 7. Now, building a 24 7 architecture is complex. It seems simple, but it's complex, right? But but you have to make sure you have a, a database that can can drive that strategy as well, right? Not all databases have a very good availability, by the way, right? So you got to look into those some of those things as well. Supporting more users, I think, is <laughs> remember we used to do capacity planning, right? Back then, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we're going to have 10,000 users. Let's let's build a system for that. Well, today you can't predict actually. <laughs> you can have a million. In an hour, right? How are you going to have a system that can support a million users, right? You're going to buy more hardware? That'll take take you another three, three months to to configure, right? So you got to start looking at those architectures of how how you can actually do a more dynamic scaling uh, for systems. Security is very important. I think uh, securing data from hackers, compliance becomes very very important. I think every organization today is starting to ramp up their security. Um, Kind of a thinking around uh, policies from uh, auditing, from uh, encryption, from a uh, vulnerability assessment perspective, from access control perspective. Uh, this becomes very important as well, especially as you start to expand the data platform to more users in, in the making as well. So, what does this modern database platform looks like? Right, I've been talking about databases, modern database. So, basically, NoSQL database is uh, this new category of database uh, which has uh, emerged over the last, I guess, decade um, and, and still is kind of evolving in a very rapid growth. And what it does is different than what is done with traditional databases, right? It can scale, it can horizontally scale out across multiple nodes in a cluster. It can deliver high performance, extreme performance. You can talk about millions of users running. In fact, if you look at Fortune 1000 companies are using NoSQL today as well, right? Even even larger e-commerce e sites are using today, right? Even the the healthcare organizations are using health, uh, no NoSQL environments as well. It's not just the cost savings, which is obviously significant, but also it's a performance and scale 
which you really drive with NoSQL, right? It's got in-memory computing architectures using Flash, using DRAM, you could, using SSD. Uh, it's also got high availability uh, built in in some of these architectures. You don't have to program them as much by sharding the data across many nodes in a cluster, right? It's agile, it's flexible to drive those strategies. So, and, and I'm not recommending that throw away all your relational databases and go with NoSQL. But but uh, but definitely a NoSQL has a place in the enterprise for at least these modern applications you're building. In fact, we've seen both. We've seen greenfield applications being built by by companies, uh, but also those traditional platforms which are struggling with performance, like the 10 terabyte database I was mentioning. This company went with NoSQL for that reason, because they were struggling with performance and scale. You can put in more hardware to scale that 10 terabyte database with traditional platforms, but eventually you're going to run out of steam on that as well, right? So you really need something which is more um, scalable to meet your business growth. So the good thing with NoSQL is it, 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 it integrates with Hadoop with Hortonworks and Clouder and MapR, right? It integrates with traditional databases as well. And you have connectors to do that. You can also have connectors to cloud sources like Salesforce, right, or LinkedIn as well. And IoT data could be used and streaming data could also be used and brought into NoSQL database platform, right? Streaming is also important. You don't really have to have static data sources coming together, but streaming data like IoT data could be coming as well. And this database platform, the NoSQL can not just do transactions, it can also do operational reporting and analytics and insights as well. It's not limited, even though people say, no, it's limited to only certain read-only things. You can also do read and write in NoSQL platforms as well. So definitely, uh, I would definitely encourage organizations to look at NoSQL. Today, the adoption is about 35% of NoSQL in, in, in across all of the verticals. And this will double in the next four years. Huge growth. In fact, a lot of people are doing POCs with NoSQL environments as well. Uh, you can do NoSQL on-premise. You can do NoSQL also in the cloud as well. So there's a good options and a good uh, things to consider, especially when you're doing a digital transformation, age of the customer, a system of engagement kind of applications this modern architecture becomes very important as well. So what are the recommendations I have for you guys? You know, first of all, look beyond the traditional database architectures to succeed and gain competitive advantage. This is very important. Your older architectures are not going to last you for another five years, actually. In fact, may not even last for many, you know, a few years, actually, especially for these modern applications you're building. They are good for the older applications which existed, unless you're running into performance issues there. But if you're building these modern applications, you definitely have to look at these newer uh, database structures, such as NoSQL. Look at NoSQL database to address your performance scale, extreme availability requirements to support digital business and age of the customer application. I think this is very fundamentally important. Uh, when you create a, a database strategy, with enterprise architectures and data architects and developers and DBAs when they're building this uh, database strategy. You know, make sure you look at what are the pros and cons of, of, of traditional platforms, but also things look at NoSQL as to where things they have gaps, you know, right? If at all they are gaps. Uh, and, but I think the more important is what the value it brings, right? I mean, most of the times we've seen that NoSQL has a lot of significant value for organizations when it comes to performance, scale, integration, availability, um, automation. I mean, those things are really hard value propositions for NoSQL environments. Makes NoSQL database a part of your database strategy, as I mentioned, right? NoSQL is viable for green field application and modernizing your existing slow moving application as well. It's both sides of the coin. We've seen customers do green field application with NoSQL, but also modernizing. Now, modernizing may require some transformations to your, from a relational to non-relational, like NoSQL platforms, but that's like a one-time thing. Uh, most people, I would say, it's right now 60, 40. 60% 60 of people are using uh, it, the NoSQL for green field application, 40 for modernizing uh, application as well. Uh, but definitely, it's applicable to both. 
look closely to the vendor solutions that are offering lower cost cluster, lower cost, as well as supporting a broader use cases. Um, cost is obviously a factor, I think, you know, for organizations uh, in this environment, and, and but also look at the solution that can scale to many different use cases, not just age of the customer as well. All right, with that, I would like to thank you and hand it over to Brian. Thank you, Noel. Uh, very interesting comments about age of the customer. So uh, my name is Brian Bukowski, and I am CTO and founder of Aerospike Technologies. We are a NoSQL database vendor. And I'd like to talk to you for a minute about the different kinds of use cases that Aerospike has seen in the field, the kind of digital transformation use cases that Noel has said are interesting for NoSQL vendors and to create the age of the customer. Uh, hopefully that will give you some ideas in your own business of how you can apply these kinds of age of the customer and digital transformation experiences with a NoSQL engine. Um, so the database landscape as we see it, as Noel was just saying, is that a lot of the new use cases really require a different database. And this is, of course, big data type architectures. You're not replacing relational systems, but you're taking these new use cases and building a separate tier of database architectures either next to or in front of your older systems. And that's simply because the amount of data and speed of data required are literally orders of magnitude, hundreds times more than previously. So of course we know from big data that an analytics tier built on Hadoop-based systems or in-memory clustered systems, uh, column stores, uh, whether it be a Vertica or other system as well as uh, Hadoop and Spark, is a critical part, and that becomes your data lake, that becomes your analytic platform that you're going to have your data architects use to generate insights and generate patterns. However, to take those analytics and bring them into your website and bring them into your day-to-day -day experience to allow a call center representative to be able to make a, a particular offer or help even better with a customer experience, you're also going to need a database that is on the operational side. And that's what's in the upper right-hand corner and really the where NoSQL has been making a name for itself within this big data environment. Typical systems, first of all, they're usually clustered. A clustered architecture gives you horizontal scalability because rarely at the beginning of a project do you know how far you're going to need to scale and how the project is going to go. You don't know whether you're going to need more compute power, more interesting algorithms, or what the data flow is going to be. So a clustered system, which is more agile and allows you to add capacity, both storage capacity and bandwidth and throughput, is absolutely a requirement. Systems like Cassandra with Scaleout and systems like MongoDB are all clustered systems that allow different kind of uh, scalability. So the use cases that we've been starting to see at Aerospike all depend on requiring the, uh, the, the architecture I'm about to explain. One question people have asked me many times is, well, if I only have a few hundred or one or two even website visitors or business transactions per second, why do I need the performance of NoSQL? And I think Noel had a, made a great point about the different kinds of data that are used to bring, bring together a decision, whether it be a recommendation, a uh, churn decision, whether to offer and discount or not. But the cases that I've been hearing about as CTO are cases where a customer will say, I have 500 business transactions per second. Okay, 500 transactions per second, that sounds in the realm of traditional database technologies. But then they said, I need to bring in 5,000 new data points as part of a computation in order to make a recommendation or determine a fraud score in real time or decide what offer to do. Suddenly, at this point, we're talking about millions of transactions per second. Now, the kind of software architecture that's necessary you see on this screen, where it says decisioning engine, that is usually the customer's code. So these are cases where cutting-edge companies have decided that there are new forms of math that they need, let's say value-at-risk calculations, fraud scores, where their data scientists have figured out an appropriate response to a given real-time situation. So they're already writing in Java, they're writing in an application environment, and they need to, on the basis of a website or a customer calling in, 
invoke their own scripts, invoke their own code, invoke their own math, because this is now the algorithm economy, and touch many points of data and many models that have been used uh, through their NoSQL, through their uh, analytics tiers. So let's talk about fraud prevention for a moment. So this is the case where you have a variety of different um, transactions, say credit card transactions being processed, and you need to be able to both prevent fraud, but also you need to let through valid transactions. Each one, each credit card processor needs to make sure that they are both minimizing fraud, but also letting valid transactions go through. Now this is, as, as Noel said, uh, an effort in modernization because fraud prevention has been with us for uh, hundreds of years, if not since the beginning of time. What you need to do is this part of this new modernization is implement new algorithms as new fraud and new attack occurs. So 10 years ago, there were these rules engines created. They're still very powerful. And you would, month after month, perhaps add new rules. Some of the classic rules would be if a credit card is used in one location and then five minutes later is used two or 300 miles away, there's no way a person moved that fast, so it is very likely to be a fraudulent transaction. There are certain kinds of purchases. Someone who buys six identical high-value watches that are known to be likely fraud. Not necessarily fraud, but likely fraud. These kinds of rules, very simple rules, this kind of market basket, this kind of repetition, provide some very simple rules that can pass and fail. However, as an effort in modernizing fraud prevention and fraud detection in real time, different companies that I've seen are applying far more interesting algorithms, algorithms that I can't disclose, they're proprietary to each company, in order to outdo their competition. So again, in the algorithm economy, each one of these companies has figured out through their own data science ways that they can get an edge on their competitor, block more fraud, let more valid fraud go through, but they need the data. And in order to do this, they need recent behavior, uh, they may need uh, recent market baskets, they may need even machine learning algorithms that they have tuned for particular uh, audiences and groups of credit cards. All of that can go into fraud prevention. And of course, wherever there's customers, there's money. Wherever there's money, there's fraud. And so we have found, for example, in advertising, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, ability to be able to prevent fraud in gaming, real-time online gaming. There's uh, different fraud cases. All of them now in modernization require picking up lots of different data points and presenting a fraud score. Within financial services, we started seeing at Aerospike the need to be able to accelerate the system of record. Now, this is the operational database that is at the core of any retail financial services company retail brokerage. Between mobile and the desire to check on your portfolio and trade status at a much higher rate, that creates a much greater load on your database, we saw different database architectures that were cache-driven. So you would have a mainframe, you would have a DB2, an Oracle, a, a system of record that has got a proper compliance and tracking, but then usually there would be a cache in front of it. And that cache often has consistency problems, it's slightly out of sync, and also can't simply take the load necessary to be able to use these new apps. So what we found at Aerospike is cases where different companies need to be able to have uh, many, many terabytes of recent trades, parent trades, child trades, how uh, a given asset or a, a given trade directive gets split into multiple uh, exchanges. All of that modernization means driving a new database choice. Another source of load on the system of record is the desire to do value at risk computations. So these are computations that are difficult to express in SQL, not impossible, but difficult. And instead of being a, desiring a 24-hour or overnight value at risk, a given brokerage wants to be able to recompute on a minute-by-minute -minute basis their margin exposure. So they need to be able to calculate each customer's margin exposure, but also the systemic risk. That's the exposure that an entire brokerage has to the sum of all of its um, cases. 
we all know now, based on recent market behavior, that this kind of desire to look at market risk, uh, we had one customer that was able to go to from overnight to down to a seven minute recalculation of its entire system. So that's the kind of power that um, modernization will give you, which of course will give you much better mar ability to present margin and allow people to trade. So again, this is um, the ability to make better decisions within um, charging. Within telco companies, there's another use case we've started seeing that involves real-time billing. As you probably know, in, if you have a cell phone, and don't we all, instead of your call being, your account being charged on a minute-by-minute -minute basis and the number of minutes you use, everyone is now being charged by the amount of data that you use. This requires the billing system to be integrated with the data routing system of the networks, not just for calls and checking every minute to see if an account is still valid, but every packet that flows through a cell phone network. So this can be used for churn analysis, but it's also used simply to make a routing decision. You've probably seen some of the more advanced offers being created by, for example, uh, T-Mobile in America, where they say, uh, we're gonna th you can choose to either throttle a particular set of videos or you can use your uh, data, and if you use your data, you get the uh, full resolution. That obviously requires, on a packet-by-packet -packet basis, looking up what a particular user has configured, what the sources and endpoints are. So this is, again, giving customers what they want in terms of better and richer, uh, more uh, available customer offerings, uh, but doing it through some very high-speed databases. You're essentially needing to update uh, databases and read and write in every router in every part of a cell phone network. So that's obviously a case where it's not just a factor of two, factor of four from a previous uh, relational system, but in fact an in-memory architecture that is distributed throughout their network. Within advertising, we've also seen a great amount of uh, use of NoSQL and these kinds of system of engagement. Um, as we know now for the last few years, advertising is be on the internet has become incredibly personalized. And what used to be simply in, say, the uh, uh, early thousands, placing ads on a particular website in order to get um, have your ad placed where you want it to, a big change occurred to trying to place ads at a particular person and even to evaluate where someone is in a buying cycle by recent behavior and then personalize that ad or decide whether to advertise or not. This is a very high, high grain um, form of personalization. It's almost like a recommendation engine in that you look at recent behavior, you look at buying patterns, you look at what uh, websites a person has been at in order to pick the right ad. Um, and it goes beyond simply ad audience categorization because we've all found that uh, if you see a website, uh, uh, an ad, and it's something that you don't really like, that can really change your experience of an entire website. So these kinds of systems, again, are mated to a Hadoop system of record, and you take those results uh, if someone is at a particular point in the buying cycle feed it into your front edge operational database, which can also track recent search terms, uh, geolocation, what device you're on. It can bait the behavior of your different devices. Um, these systems are often required now millions of transactions per second, and to track all of the current objects and cookies on the internet, um, thus billions of objects these kinds of velocities also non-stop because unlike a financial services company, the internet literally doesn't stop. So overnight, there's no idea of having downtime. These systems must be uh, truly high availability. So hopefully this is giving you some ideas about digital transformations and systems to enable your digital transformation. You're gonna need a NoSQL database that has an architecture that removes caches for simplicity, that has a higher level of performance and as well as a predictable performance. If you're gonna get all 5,000 of those items, you can't have a few of them lag behind. It throws off uh, the performance of your system. You're gonna need forms of clustering to make sure you can add and remove capacity as necessary. Also, you need to make sure that this system is going to be affordable as you start to expand, because some of these projects are going to take off, and your manager is going to be asking, uh, how do we need a bunch more of these servers? You have to make sure it's going to end up being cost effective as well. And they, of course, enable smart applications. Now, I'm going to just talk for a few seconds about how Aerospike specifically answers this. 
So Aerospike is a clustered database. It has a client server architecture. So instead of a cached architecture where system data is in memory on every server, that is clearly non-scalable. You have a client server architecture with a cluster of database servers, and you have clients written drivers written in Java, uh, C, uh, Ruby, PHP, Node, all of the modern languages that can then uh, read and write from the database in order to be able to pick up new data. The ability to be able to have high availability across geographic regions and thus have um, is, is of critical importance because high availability means not just being able to fail over within a data center, but the fact that you will need a disaster recovery plan and an up-to-date copy of the data somewhere else. Uh, we've certainly seen cases at Aerospike where uh, disasters have occurred and there's been immediate failover to different regions of the country. One thing that we find at Aerospike that enables these kinds of data rates is the use of Flash as an in-memory technology. So while other databases, even other NoSQL databases, are capable of using Flash to get two to three times in increase in performance, and is certainly if you're using a system like Mongo or Cassandra, you're almost certainly using Flash. At Aerospike, we've really invested in specifically writing our technology that is Flash optimized. What this means is that you can reach performance levels of hundreds of thousands or millions of requests per second, read and write, against an individual server in a clustered system using Flash. So instead of being bound by memory limitations, which are going to mean that you're not going to be able to store quite as much data, not going to be able to understand your customers quite as well, being able to move into Flash as your primary store for this operational database not only gives you increase in reliability and increase in durability because it's not RAM that loses data when powered off, but also a lower cost. So we find that that is one of the ways that you're going to get more data at a reasonable price. So the kinds of performance differences that we see compared to other data, no, other NoSQL databases are a pretty big difference versus, say, Cassandra as shown in this system. So these are some numbers that we've recently pulled out uh, based on both in-memory and flash persistence with Mongo and Cassandra. So um, I do suggest, as Noel does, that you look at NoSQL technologies in general. Um, however, uh, we think that Aerospike should be part of your POC and part of uh, how you look at NoSQL. That ends our presentation. Thank you very much for uh, tagging along for us today. Um, we have a few questions uh, that have come in while we've been um, talking. So. Um, First of all, uh, Noel, how do you suggest that people start in their journey to uh, customer personalization and age, and age of engagement? Yeah, so it's a, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, definitely, you know, you got to look at, uh, you know, first of all, put a, put a strategy together as to what all data are you going to be getting from different sources, right? Whether it's going to be internal sources, uh, external sources. Um, what kind of latency is going to exist out there, um, and, and then you start to build a platform. Uh, start start with a smaller you know, deployment. You don't really have to go out all all out and, and build a very hefty uh, implementation, and, and, and start to have developers build some of the frameworks, uh, some of the algorithms, some of the programming constructs necessary to build the age of the customer, and, and start to integrate those data in, into this platform. Um, you know, and the good thing with like, uh, you know, as Brian was mentioning about NoSQL is, is, the, is the scalability. You know, you can actually keep on adding additional um, nodes and, and, and you can scale out. Uh, and the good thing with that architecture is that, you know, you don't have to plan ahead actually uh, trying to build these, the perfect server configuration that you need actually. And, 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 and that's something is, is a very important thing um, because first of all, it's cost. I mean, your cost of, of deployment are very low. Uh, initially, and, and yet you can reap the benefits. The business can reap the benefits right away, without much of a constraint there. Uh, and also, you, know, you, can, you can grow as you scale. You know, I mean, you can grow in terms of the servers and then scale to meet the business needs and in terms of performance, in terms of requirements. And then you keep on adding additional sources. You know, so so you start with a few sources. Uh, because uh, because I think that's where the benefit comes in, you know, right? I mean, you don't really have, and you can have this running, the whole age of the customer kind of scenarios within a month, actually. 
I mean, that's what customers do. Don't spend like six months trying to do this, right? Within a month, have it available. And, and then you add additional resources like, like the data coming in from different uh, you know, systems for the touch points. And, and then obviously grow the the number of nodes in a cluster kind of configuration as well. So so kind of the it's kind of a scalable architecture. And that's I think the best practice today. What we're seeing customers succeeding with it. Uh, I think I think those are the ones which really help uh, a lot. You know. So. Sounds great. Um, so no, I shared some of the things that I've seen at Aerospike in terms of people actually getting started with this. Uh, specifically, what have you been seeing out there in terms of people who have rolled out their own systems? In terms of the sorry, the in terms of use cases or yeah, exactly. No. Uh, in terms of people who have come in and 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 asked for briefings, and you've actually seen them uh, engage in this journey. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually benefit a, a lot of these success points, right? I mean, the success points obviously is important, right? Uh, being able to minimize churn and being able to get new customer, new business, I, I think is a fundamental important thing. And data helps a lot today, right? Previously, data never helped a lot as much, but today, data helps a lot. And I think, I think if you architect this platform in a manner which can help the the marketing, the sales people, uh, I think that's the fundamental thing, right? Whether it's a health and care, healthcare, or, or oil and gas, or financial services, or retailers, I think it's across the the board. Uh, and I think. We've seen the adoption of these critical systems like the age of the customer uh, across all of these verticals, which I, th I think is, is really, really important uh, for, from, a, from a deployment strategy as well. Um, what, Brian, what have you been seeing, I guess, from, from your end, I guess? Uh, well, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've got a bunch of folks in telecom, you know, trying to do these kinds yeah, of personalized yeah. billing. We've seen financial services, um, newer, richer interfaces to trading apps, uh, as well as uh, these fraud detection cases, uh, which is sort of an age of the customer, right? If you understand the yep. customer, you understand if it's a bad guy. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be beyond just age of the customer. I mean, uh, we, we talk about age of the customer, customer a lot, but there could be other things as well, right? There's real-time analytics out there, real-time reporting as well. There's fraud detection, as Brian was mentioning out there. There's also all of these automation from a billing uh, perspective, right, from, from uh, from being able to have a better sense about trends uh, from, from, from the product innovation and growth. What, what is the traction of a product? When, when a product gets launched, like what kind of traction is there? I mean, all these things can be done with this, this platform like, like NoSQL. So it's not fundamentally age of the customer is only the only big case, but it's many, many, uh, as we can tell. Uh, whether even IoT, which is, I think, a big use case out there, which is emerging, 20% uh, adoption today in IoT uh, across the industries. Uh, that has, has been growing very, very rapidly, you know, and, and I think that's another important area where you have to see, you, you want to start to, you know, start obviously with the, with the one use case which is more prominent, uh, rather attacking all of the use cases, but then you can see the, the value um, as you uh, build this platform, you actually can, can do a lot more use cases than, than what you were originally planning to do, actually, <laughs> with it, you know. Yeah, yeah I've, I was just thinking, I've seen uh, pretty interesting cases that are all very business specific. So I was talking recently to a uh, betting and gambling company and they need to better um, database power because they're trying to have finer and finer grained bets on various different propositions. So, you know, whether it be betting in election markets or this, that, or the other thing, they wanted to have, you know, finer and finer, more personalized offering, you know, just because it's more engaging to have different kinds of bets. Uh, sorry, sorry, so it's all it, very it specific industry. Yeah. Even search, you know, search is another important area thing, you know, where, where people want to search data in the enterprise and they, they can't do it <laughs> because, because traditional platforms don't allow that search capabilities in, in a very flexible sense, especially if data may be uh, unstructured, becomes even messier, right? So uh, I think search is definitely being an important area and uh, I think people are trying to use the, the platforms for broader things, uh, and all, including gaming as well, right? And, and so, yeah. Uh, so another question has come in. Um, so when people, an enterprise starts on this process, there's always a choice to either start building your own data architect group and data science group and figuring it out yourself versus trying to use an outside service. Uh, and it could be, say, an online service just for reporting, but it also could be, um, for example, different services that allow you to do uh, login and a variety of things um, or recommendations, say a recommendation service. 
how do you advise people in terms of whether to be using internal services that have a certain amount of risk and, and cost versus using outside services that may not be specific to your business needs? Well, I mean, I think, you know, what we've seen is that uh, certainly, um, you know, services, uh, they, they, they actually have to do with, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of data you're dealing with. I mean, if it's sensitive data, there's, there's always a control issue there. <laughs> people people want to avoid as much as services, external services to be involved. Uh, uh, if at all they are involved, they've got to have everything uh, controlled in terms of data sets and what have you. Um, but I would say typically organizations who are just getting on the journey of this digital transformation age of the customer are, are the more likely to get the external services because they haven't experienced that whole change in transformation. We got a lot of inquiries about customers about like NoSQL. Um, they are very early, well, early kind of uh, adopters or, or maybe the, the, the folks who are not yet done NoSQL implementation in the organizations, they struggle with some of those thinking about why should they care about NoSQL, right? But, but, but I think as you go deeper and understand the value proposition, people don't back out of that NoSQL because they realize the benefit it brings in, right? So the people who actually haven't gone through that cycle, they're the, they're, they're the people who look for external services and help uh, trying to get them on board of that. I think that's a very important area because if you're not certain about where you are with NoSQL and, and data platforms, you want to get an external uh, help to, 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 to drive the strategy. But those people who have done one or two projects are typically having internal services drive uh, their uh, the additional strategies for them as well. So, so I guess it's twofold depending on where you look at it, right? But, but also, as mentioned, security comes into play as well because security is an important discussion, especially in financial services and healthcare, where people are cautious about you know what all things could be could be included. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, security is also very important as part of the NoSQL platform, and and NoSQL actually offers also a very good security model, which people realize over time, you know. Right? Great. Um, so one question came in about uh, Aerospike and reporting tools and what reporting tools are used with Aerospike. So commonly what I've seen with Aerospike is that that analytics tier that I mentioned in the early part of the architecture, that analytics tier is usually where you'll run your reports. So there's this parallel analytics portion. Most people find that using your operational database, which is your front line moment by moment website, is not the best place for running reports. Of course, Aerospike does support Spark integration and Hadoop integration, so we can actually do uh, forms of reporting on the hot data, but really it's often the analytics tools uh, that'll be best suited and actually get you better answers. So this is really the world of polyglot architectures where different databases are used for, for different purposes. Um, so uh, Noel, uh, just uh, maybe one last question. Um, so. If you were going to sum up and really say what are what are one or two thoughts you'd like to leave behind to the audience about um, where they should start, where they should go, and really what the key uh, points are that you'd like them to understand. Well, I, th I think uh, very important is that you don't want to do this project in isolation. <laughs> Uh, you want to get a team involved, uh, a team of players involved, uh, a team of different roles involved uh, from a security perspective, from a data architecture team in, uh, perspective, from a developer perspective, um, from, a, from a data administration perspective. Uh, those are important. You, know, you, you want to have a team of people from different roles involved for this system of engagement, uh, digital transformation, because, because if you're just going to just do it in isolation, that, hey, I'm, I'm a developer, I'm going to build it myself and, and, and deliver it, but that's not going to really help uh, as much, because you really have to involve the enterprise. Right? And, and, and you know, this is not a project-driven, right? I mean, you can, you can make it a project-driven architecture and, and, and deployment, but it's, it's more of an enterprise kind of a thing. So, which is why you have to get involved in many different roles. Now, when you put a group together of, of eight or ten people, you then obviously get business people involved as well, the line of businesses, the marketing, the sales, and all uh, involved. And, and you kind of drive a strategy. Uh, you, you start small and grow, as I mentioned. You know, so don't think of having a six-month or a year project for, for delivering this. No. Start, start small. And, and I think that's the, the value you kind of drive. You know, and, and, and you look at, a, look at a platform like database platform, 
uh, you know, you want to have a platform that can automate as much as possible, right? I mean, you don't want to be dealing with technology issues like scalability and performance and, 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 and integration and, and agility, right? I mean, you want to actually have that um, being done the database platform itself and, and, and writing specific programs or using tools, it actually helps a lot actually to automate. Uh, as I mentioned, within a few months, you can be up and running with this, right? And I think that's a very important key takeaway. And right? I mean, start small and grow, and, and and have a team, and and have a technology that can scale. That is, I think, very important. You don't want to get stuck six months down the road. <laughs> that we run into a limit of an architecture that can't go beyond that certain limit from a performance and scale. Uh, that would be terrible, right? Then you've got to start to look at other options out there. Look at an option. You want to start small, but but look at an option that can scale for the next couple of years, right? Um, I think those are important things uh, of, of discussion points, you know. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, no, I completely agree. And uh, what I counsel people really is, even though I'm at Aerospike and uh, we're one of the NoSQL vendors, I really just try to get people started on any project with any NoSQL database. Um, I believe Aerospike has a lot of unique capabilities. But I'd rather start with something else and then the limits of that database, um, there's always uh, a faster, more specific database. So I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. Uh, hopefully it's been an action-packed hour and you've learned or found a new way to think about some um, systems of engagement and digital transformation. Um, we've uh, got a, uh, we'll be sending to your email address a PDF copy of the slide presentation for your um, uh, viewing pleasure. And um, have a great day. Thank you for attending. Thanks.